cloud. All right, welcome back to the Real Estate Locker Room Show, folks. I'm your host, John Carney, and thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy day uh, to tune in. I'm truly, truly grateful for all you return listeners. I was just talking to my guest about um, you folks out there that like to uh, connect with me across various social media platforms and reach out by email. So, you know, please keep that up because it's your support that, uh, you know, makes this podcast successful and keeps me going. If this is your first time uh, tuning into the show, I'd like to say welcome. I hope you enjoy this. You know, the goal here is to look at the uh, intersection, the competitive intersection between sports and the real estate business, but it translates into all sorts of things in life, right? Competition um, and, and discipline, I suppose, is another way to wrap that up. But the goal here is to deliver you actionable advice uh, on how you can elevate your real estate investing game today uh, to continue to raise the bar in your specific area of expertise in the real estate industry. You know, whether you're an investor or an industry pro, welcome to the show that believes that real estate is a team sport. And uh, man, do we have a great um, episode here that we're going to kick off. It's uh, number 97 with my very special guest, Damian Lupo. Welcome, Damian. Hey, John. It's good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Number 97. Here we go. Number 97. Let's get it done. All right. Well, you know, um, I just want to give a shout out to this awesome box, Black Belt Wealth. We're going to be talking about wealth creation today, guys. Damien's an author. Um, I'm not big on reading bios. We'll get into his, his success story here in a moment. But, um, you know, welcome to the show, Damien. And, and, and just to kind of kick off or stretch off, however, whatever analogy you want to uh, relate to, to um, warming up, you know, let's talk about, um, let's talk about, um, inspiration and and i like to draw on the inspiration from from athletes do you have a uh, an athlete that's inspired you you know it's it, I, I was thinking about that um and and I, I as a kid i i remember that i wasn't really like i was the guy that got picked last and so you know it, sports were not necessarily my thing my sport was more of a it was like verbal and intellectual jujitsu you know to be able to to intellectually be able to engage with people and and as i as I went through life, I, I found Aikido, which is the martial art I started with. And so the, the founders of that, like George Leonard and uh, O Sensei, Mora Hayashiba, uh, these guys are just, there's, they play at a different level. Uh, when we see videos of, of some of the, the martial arts out there, it looks fake because that's the level of, of engagement and conscious presence that they have. So I think that that really probably hits a certain, every, people at the highest level of sports in general are in that space with martial arts it looks like something choreographed when you see somebody that's been studying 30, 40, 50 years, because they look like it, it just looks, it doesn't look real. And so those are the guys that, that amaze me, not because of their talent, but because of their commitment. Yeah. It's um, look, I find the, the martial artists, the, 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 the discipline that comes out of, we'll say the East, wherever, wherever the origins of this, of the discipline are, of the art, I'm not, I'm not a martial artist, but I, I do enjoy reading about it and, and there's always something to learn, right? So, I mean, you're talking about, can you just give the audience a brief background on, on your accreditations in the martial arts? So I, I started off in a couple of the wrong places and this is a good example and a good metaphor for, uh, for business. Like I went out there and did karate and taekwondo and they didn't fit. When I found a keto, I fell in love and it stuck. That was 20 years ago. And so I started off with that five years later earned my black belt, which it's an interesting thing. People say, I want to be a black belt. I want a black belt. And I say, cool. They go, how long does it take? And I say, well, it takes about 15 minutes and about eight bucks. Go to Dick's Sporting Goods. You get yourself a black belt. You're done. If you want to become a black belt, all you're really doing is you're proving that you're committed to being a student. And so I, to me, I had committed in my mind and my soul that I was a student. It took about five years. And then from there, ended up with three other black belts, founded my own martial art called Yokido, which is a blend of Aikido, yoga, and Reiki. And so it's an art that not only diffuses conflict, but heals the, the aggressor or the, the negative energy, the, uh, the destructive energy in the process of moving through it and protecting everybody in the, in the fight, if you will. So that was the journey. And ultimately, when you do something long enough, it just becomes who you are. So I don't know that any one label could define me other than Yokido, because it's really, I just gave a label to the essence of what I, what I teach and, and how I approach life. And so I, I would imagine, so th there's just a tremendous amount of discipline, correct? And, in, in, um, well, in, in 
achieving the different the different degrees or the different tests that you have to pass right in in a martial art practice but um you, you said something that i'd like to to just have you expand upon because it hasn't been mentioned this way but i mean you said you're, you 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 have to make a commitment to being a student and for for any entrepreneur or business leader or or you know first time person thinking about getting into real estate i mean you're just always a student aren't you at the moment you think that you're done, that you've mastered something, you're about to get your ass handed to you. I, I remember the very the very first seminar I went to back in to the it was January 2000 in Orlando. I went out there and there were some guys outside the the conference and they said they they were loaning money out. They wanted to, to loan money out, hard money loans. And I went up to them and I said, I'd like to borrow some money. How do I do that? And they said, How many deals have you done? And I said, One last week. And they said, Good. When you've done five, you lost a couple. Come back to us. And I thought you guys are pricks. And what I didn't understand at the time is they needed to see me go out and do something, not talk a big game. And it's easy to talk about it, but in the real world, there's real bullets flying. And, and so I went through that process of having a lot of bullets fly by me and a lot of them hit me, you know, straight in the chest and knocked me down, lost all my money several times. And, and the biggest, the biggest knockdown was in 2008 when I lost my $20 million empire. And it doesn't matter if it's 20 million or 20,000, it's all you have. And then you go negative the same amount it, it really, uh, it, it changes you. It, it kind of rewires and, and breaks you, but it, it adds scar tissue. And ultimately, I believe scar tissue is what is wisdom. And when you have somebody that's bald or gray or more scar tissue, you know that they probably have insights that you're never going to get from a book. And that's why we have people around us that have been there, done that, not just studied some damn thing and then are regurgitating the information. It's the people that have actually lived it. Yeah, and it, well, it, I suppose it's fun to be surrounded by the group of um, enthusiastic, hard-charging, younger entrepreneurs. And, 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 and I say younger because to me, I, I'm 45. So if they're younger than me, they're younger. And then uh, I also want to be surrounded by people much older and wiser than me. And, um, you know, th there's a blend of we'll, we'll talk about the energy, right? Um, especially the folks who, who've been doing deals and I'm, I'm blessed. I'm around a lot of, a lot of deal makers that have, have been doing this a long time and, and certain business practices change marketing changes, right? We don't have fax machines anymore. We've got internet. And, and Except and the government. Now keep the government still takes faxes, believe it or not. They're like, they, they say fax it to me and I, I go, what, how you're the only people, the only group that actually still does this. The, well, let, they're, they're people from around the world here. So we can say, the U.S. government, which isn't doing okay, maybe the U.S. government, yeah, of, of presenting a um, you know, the fax machine there, folks. Maybe that's what the problem really is. But anyways, you, you know, certain things change, certain things remain the same. The art of the deal is the uh, you know the, the deal, deal making. Um, you know how you engage with other people to kind of get to the result that's that, that you want and they want. Right, you're not going to get to a one sided result that's good for anybody. Maybe I'm going down a rabbit hole, but um, okay. So back on track. We've got uh, your, your your martial art. You you were inspired by martial artists and the art of Aikido, um, and that took you down the track. And it does sound like um, you know, you know I want to hear your real estate success story from the beginning. But with martial arts, you tried a few things that didn't work out. Is that sort of um, you know, uh, uh, does that parallel into into the world of real estate, or did you find your niche right away? I, yeah, it, it's the exact same thing, and. It, when I, when I hear somebody in general saying, I did this thing, it worked, and I'm the master guru, and they, they don't have a failure story, then I run because they're going to have a failure story. It's only a matter of time, or they've already had it and they're just lying about it. And so when, you, when we talk about success stories, I would say I just had a lot more failures than most people. And so my success story is, is just a pile of failures, and each of those failures is a stepping stone towards deeper and deeper mastery. So I think when we're trying to, like, we're, we're, we typically go after success. Most Western civilization is just success. In fact, maybe the whole world is thinking about success. Although when you go to Eastern parts of the world, it's a longer game. It's a longer playbook. And in, in, the, in the States and maybe even Australia and, and Europe, there's definitely a more aggressive force towards getting things done faster. And it's, a, it's not, a, not allowing seasons to happen. So whether it's real estate or martial arts or growing a, a zucchini in a garden, the, the, when you start forcing things, you start putting pressure on things that eventually break because it's not natural. And when you go with the flow on things and you plant seeds and you nurture them, whether it's martial arts or real estate, it's amazing how the universe conspires with you versus against you. I've seen that time and again. And sometimes you have storms 
whether it's, you know, whether your, your stuff gets washed away or whether you break your arm in a dojo or whether your deal goes bad and you lose money, there are storms that are part of it, but you know what? Generally they don't kill you. And so if you're listening to this right now, you haven't been killed by a deal or an event. And that's, that's the thing that I think people d don't understand. They say, well, I'm, I, I'm internally, our mind is thinking, I don't want to make a mistake because I don't want to lose because I don't want to die. Well, unless you grew up in Alaska or Africa where things actually do eat you, like I grew up in Alaska and the last job I had was dodging polar bears in the Arctic Circle. I could have been eaten by a mistake. Most people don't have that issue. You're not going to be eaten by a mistake. You are going to learn. And the learning is where the wisdom comes from. So your last job, what was the statistics of being being attacked by a, by a polar bear, right? Someone who's sitting on the other side of the world and is never, ever going to go to Alaska probably has a very high survival rate against the, the Arctic, huh? That's cool. I mean, I agree with that. If, and and that's, that's sort of what I like to go back to as a frame of reference, right? Um, most of us don't, don't go put ourselves in positions where we could die. Um, a lot of people do for, for sport and, and for their job, but I believe they're making those decisions based on, you know, will, free will, not, not by force. So we're talking about those folks. Um, well, cool. So you get into real estate. And, and starts like you, it sounds like you had a, um, a really good success story prior to the 2008 disaster, correct? Yeah, the success was, was kind of interesting because I was, I was going along. I naively did what most people should do, follow somebody that's been down the road and just mimic and model and, and copy their thing. You got teachers and, and people tend to think that they need to create something different. Well, in real estate, there's plenty, of, there's millions of success stories. So you just model the difference between it not working and working is the work. Like if you're willing to do the work, I know it's like a four letter word, but if you do the work, you get to the other side. And I just listened to people on stages and in their books. And I said, oh, okay, well, that's the formula. And so I did the formula and worked my butt off. And all of a sudden, over a couple of years, there were a whole big pile of houses. And, and that's, that's all it really was. It, was. it was just the tenacity and the commitment to be engaged and be naive enough to do the work without saying, well, I can redo this and I can have a better formula. I get that. But it's, it's like saying, I'm going to invent a martial art before I've taken a class yet stupidest, arrogant, most egotistical thing I've ever heard. And people do that all the time. I've got a better widget. Well, yeah, but what are you trying to get to? Are you trying to create a widget or are you trying to create wealth? And it's usually the wealth. So why not just model? And then once you've modeled it and created it, great, go create something new and fresh and exciting. And then if somebody cares, maybe you have another thing for wealth. But I think that that's, that's the shift people need to make into just modeling success versus trying to make it all up. We don't have enough time in our lives to make everything up. No, we don't. And, and I'm, I'm everything that I like to tell people, I'm not that clever. So if, if I'm telling you something, um, I haven't made it up. I'm probably repeating something I've learned and maybe reframing it for my audience, but, or, or the person I'm talking to. So, you know, work being a four letter word, I, I, I believe it's, it's one of my values, hard work, but I mean, you also have the other four letter word that I believe in to be, to be successful and that's team. Right. So, I mean, is that, did you, did you latch onto that concept that there's definitely people that you have to have on your team that, that will accelerate the success versus keep you kind of stagnant? Well, that, that's the other side of, of being young and naive or just naive in general or being super smart. Uh, th th those are all problematic in that we think we can do all these things ourselves or we don't understand the value of a team. And nowadays I'm, I've got a team that's much smarter and much better than me in all these different things that they do. And I, I laugh when I think about when I used to do things and I was the smartest guy in the room, which made me the dumbest guy in the room for having that attitude that I was the smartest guy and for hiring people and bringing people in that were not that smart. And it was more of an ego thing to make sure I, I felt smart all the time. And a lot of times we do that. The worst is people that are super highly educated because they tend to think, well, I'm smart enough to do anything. And so they become the accountant, the, the attorney, the, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And it becomes a big old mess because nothing gets done very well. And so that, that was the big shift. Now that I, I get it, it's not just, I get it. I do it. You know, the team is, is priceless. And if you don't have a team that's world-class, you're heading for a cliff. I agreed. I, I want to just talk about something that, um, you know, that that's right on your right, right at the bottom of your homepage. So for the listeners out there, we'll, we'll have links to, to Damien's homepage, but right there at the bottom is, is something that, that caught my eye and you make a statement. Wealth is a choice. Um, would you, would you elaborate on that and, and then talk about, um, 
you know, what you offer to help investors real, who, who want to make that choice get there because um, making the choice and getting there are two different things, two different points on the line. Yeah. And, and, and John, they're both equally important, making the choice and then actually going into and taking the steps. Our, I mean, wealth is, it, wealth is interesting because our system has been taught, we've been taught that wealth is a number. People, I hear people all the time, well, my financial advisor told me that if I, my formula is that when I, I need to get to $2.7 million and then I will, be, I will be financially set for retirement. Like this is the big thing. It's a number. It's not a number. If I hand you $2.7 million right now, you're going to be afraid to lose it. Just like people that I had this couple that came to me about six, seven years ago and they, they said, we need help. And I said, with what? They said, well, we've got about $2 million and we are in our fifties. We don't want to lose it. And we don't really know what to do. They had accidentally stumbled upon it. And this is what most people have. They have accidental quote unquote wealth. What they have is cash and cash is trash because they don't know what to do or how to recreate it. So wealth is a choice. That's not wealth. And neither is cash flow. What's really, what's really a, the, the wealth is the experiences you have that can't be taken away from you when you go through this stuff. So whether you make the money, lose the money, make the money, keep the money, if you've gone through this stuff and you understand how it can't be taken away and you're truly free. If you haven't gone through the process of building the muscle and you're in part of you, your wealth side looks like Pee Wee Herman, you're, you, you're going to have a problem because you're never truly going to be settled into your confidence and the confidence is where the wealth is. So choosing that is choosing to go through it. You can't, it's like, I want to be, I want to be healthy and, and I want to have a great body. You can't do that by staring through the window at the gym. Like you, you have to actually pick up the weights. You have to do the process. And that's, that's what people try to skip out or hack. And I get, there's a lot of good hacks out there. Tim Ferriss is, you know, he hacked your four hour life and, and the whole thing. But the, the reality is you're not going to hack your way to wealth. You've actually got to go do it and become it. And so it's a choice. Are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to take a step forward? It's not just in your head. It starts in your head and then it, it, it continues into your feet. So it's head to toe. Like you can't do one and not the other. There is no way to hack that process. It has to be all or none. So that that's a, I, I love the way that you defined it. Wasn't what I was expecting, but I was listening and, and I like it. And so, um, you know, first, first step, right? What is the first step you, you that, that you, in, in your way of, of, of um, coaching? Well, the, the first thing is, is it's actually interesting because after I lost the $20 million, I said, okay, well, the first thing I did is I denied that I had made a mistake. I was like, oh yeah, everything is fine. I still, you know, I'm still wealthy. I've got my Ferrari still. And, and then I didn't, and I've got my black card. I can spend anything. And then I got declined using it for toilet paper. So I, you know, there was a, it was a humbling experience. And then after that, I said, okay, well, I need to fix whatever was the problem. What was the problem? Bad choices? No, bad DNA, bad virtues, bad values. Values that didn't exist other than more. It was a very hedonistic approach to life. And when I did the work, I asked the question, what is true? And so the, the, first, the first question, no matter where you're at, what you're doing is, what is actually true about right now, today, you, your life? And most of us don't want to look at that. We're like, oh, well, here's my goal. It's like, yeah, cool, but where are you at? And where were you at a year ago? What's your trajectory? So we look at now and we look at the direction you're heading. And that's the truth for everybody. Because I can tell you where you're going to be in a year if I look back a year and you're not changing anything. And changing something is, it's like our lives are more like an aircraft carrier, big old boat or a cruise ship. You want to turn that thing, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. And that's called rewiring your, your DNA. If you say, well, I'm more, like, I'm more like a horse. I can just take a left turn. Now, well, you know, there's not a whole lot of momentum. If you want momentum, and that's what's driven you to this point in your life, you're more like a cruise ship. So we have to acknowledge what's true and where you've been going. And, and that's, tr that's based on what you think is important. So the first step is digging into people's C's, their cash, their credit, and their calendar. And once we understand what you're spending your time, your money, and your credit on, I can tell you exactly what you value and I can tell you where you're going. That's what came out of the work that, that my friend Chris and I did in Reinvented Life. We wrote this book to really understand our process where we reinvented and to give people questions because I have no doubt you, John, or anybody else listening, has the answers if the right questions are put in front of them. So here's the work. Here's the first work. Do the work inside Reinvented Life. A answer the questions that are posed in there and just download the workbook. It's, it's on the site and you can actually start doing the work. That's the first step. If you're not willing to acknowledge the truth, I mean, seriously, go, go eat some Twinkies and, and, and uh, you know, drink a cold beer and you're, you're, you're toast. You have to be willing to answer the questions about what is true first. I like that. I'm, I'm glad that we're going to be able to link that content. Um, you know, in the show notes, but we'll get to that in a second. So, I mean, you have, uh, 
how how did the discipline of the martial arts we want our kids to, i want my kids to get in the martial arts for the discipline and and they're already board sport athletes as much as they can do um in in the midwest and when they make it to the coast right four and six and and so it, it, there's there's a part of the martial arts that i like i've never practiced like i said but maybe someday with the kids i will is is the discipline right it's not about the combat or or the um even so much that self-defense as it is the discipline of the repetition trying to get them to you know understand how good habits are formed and hopefully be around a group of people that make good choices right so you know the, how did that help you it, uh, i mean did, was that the basis for what you built your business on and and is there something that you you know one one pro tip from the whole life experience to date that you could give our audience who, who wants to make a change the one pro tip is learn how to be present the martial arts is more about being present and aware than anything else it's not about how fast you kick or how how much you can throw somebody or choke them out or anything else it's about how present you are the more present you are the more powerful you are whether it's in business or martial arts presence is almost it's almost um powerful enough to knock you over when you're with somebody that's super present there is an energy there that is so almost intimidating and peaceful at the same time. It's hard to even put words around it. And we can practice this, whether you're out there on a, in a dojo or you're understanding the process of practicing meditation, you're sitting still for five seconds or five minutes or five hours. It doesn't really matter what you're doing, but the, the ultimate is being present to what is true. So we go back to that thing. How do you find out what is true? You got to start with being present. So when I said the first step is asking the question, what is true? That's cool. If you're not present, you're never going to stay with the present moment of truth. So you got to you got to start with being present. And sometimes the easiest thing to do is is taking a walk in nature and just paying attention. No no devices, just like connecting. Um, it's really fascinating how powerful that one thing can be. It's one of the great blessings of this pandemic. A lot of us have been spending more time connecting and grounding, and we weren't really doing that. We were just chasing the next app or widget or or next flashy thing. You know, the next shiny nut because we're like a bunch of drunk squirrels running around. And it's, it, that's not where any power lives. It lives in the power in the moment. And when, you, when you're present to the moment, you actually can control and direct your life. If you're not, you have no chance. So I, I like what you said about the presence, but it's, it's difficult. That's, that, that, is, that is not, um, I, don't, I don't find it easy. And, and turning off technology, and I suppose the example I could use is, is when I'm with my children, right? To, to, to switch off work and to switch off the noise when they start talking i feel it's important to try and stop and engage but i mean it, it's hard work and same thing when you're in a meeting and you're looking around the table and people who should be present are typing away on their computer and and sending people text messages you know that, that's a distraction that distracts my presence i mean what what are some is is there a tool or or, or a tip that you could give people that are really focused on hey They've listened to this. They, oh, maybe they're out for a run or they're in their car. How, how can I be more present in my next interaction that matters? Well, the, the tool is tolerance. How much tolerance do you have for your own idiocy and addictions? And I have the same thing. And so when, we, like when I have a meeting with my team, I'll just stop the meeting right in the middle. If I see somebody that's not present, that's not with me, that's not connecting with the team and with everybody, I'll just stop and say, whoa, whoa, wait. We're not doing emails. We're not doing calls. We're not doing texts. That'll wait. We're going to be done in five minutes. And it's just calling it out, call it out on yourself because it's not hard to put the phone down. The problem is it's like an addiction because of the dopamine hits when we get all these different feeds and the texts and with the fear of missing out, all those things have been baked into this technology where we're literally addicts to it. And I mean, it's the same crap, whether you're an alcoholic or a drug addict or a sex addict or whatever, it's chemistry in our brains. We want this stuff because we get a high, a new email comes in. It's like Amazon showing up on your door, your porch. Oh, look, a new present. And then we look at it. And we're afraid something bad's going to happen. And we're excited on the other side that something good is going to happen. So how do you do that? You just practice. But how do you practice? You start with your tolerance, which is your rules that you have to write down. When you write them down, you put them in front of yourself. And then you share them. Share them with a spouse. Share them with your kids. Share them with your colleagues. Here are the rules. How many of us actually have rules? I did not have rules for 10 years. Now I have really hardcore rules. It's to protect me from me and my stupid like reptilian brain that wants to go off there and, and like eat cake every meal. Like I have rules and then I can be accountable to those rules, both with myself and with other people. It's a huge, powerful shift. Very, very wealthy people, very, very free people have rules about what they'll tolerate. And they say no to almost everything. 
Why? Because they know clearly what their rules are. I love that. That's great. That's great advice. And I think that, uh, well, hopefully that this will help folks who are tuning in into episode 97, you know, raise the bar, just like what we talked about at the beginning. Great, Damien. Well, um, there's a couple, there's a couple questions that, that I like to conclude with. And one is, you know, about, I find that success leaves clues and, and entrepreneurs like yourself generally have a pretty good reading list. Um, is there a book that you, that you must have around on your shelf that um, you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah, there's two. I mean, obviously the, the 12 that I've written, I think are amazing. Some of them are terrible in terms of what they look like, but there's, there's real reality around them. The two that I study that are not mine are principles and mastery. Principles came out recently from, from Ray Dalio because you have to understand if you don't have principles, you're just going to go with the wind and the wind is always changing. And it's not necessarily where you, where you really have a vision for your life to be, but it takes you there. And the other one is mastery by George Leonard, not by Robert Greene. George Leonard wrote this book. He was a martial, martial artist. He was a sixth degree, uh, Akidoka, uh, Aikido martial artist. And one of the most powerful things in mastery was his discussion around plateauing. And this is a process that happens in life where we do the same thing over and over again. And it's like, well, I'm really working hard. And the question is, am I on a merry-go-round or am I plateauing where one day I'm going to pop out into a different level? And that's where reflection and other people can help you see whether or not you're doing Groundhog Day or whether this is the fulfillment process towards mastery. So I really, really encourage everyone, martial arts or not, to read Mastery by, by George Leonard and, and just make sure you've, you've got your principles, what, what's driving you. Because ultimately, if you understand that, it makes making decisions a lot easier. Yeah, I love principles. I follow him. I've got the book. And, and I'm not going to say I've, I'm, I've, it's a thick book, so it's got a, it's a small dent in it, but one step at a time. But uh, you can get you can get the uh, I call it my wife and I call it catting, swiping, whatever you want to call it. Like that's kind of uh, when I do switch onto that for entertainment purposes. At least on Instagram, um, principles shows up in my news feed, which I which I'm which I'm quite fond of. So follow Ray uh, and principles on Instagram. Well, great. You've already given us a pro tip. Um, is there, is there a, uh, a practice that, that you have that, that gets you in the right mindset to, to get, you know, started with your day and, and, and charge hard? Every day, there, we've heard this in different ways, most likely, uh, starting your day with gratitude. And so whether that's writing a note to somebody or going out into nature and just sitting still for five seconds. Now, you, you mentioned sometimes it's, it's hard. It's hard to to turn it off or to get your mind to calm down or, or whatever it is that's hard. It's not hard to do it for three seconds or five seconds or 15 seconds and asking the question, what am I grateful for? It, it could, it'll take less than a minute. Starting the day in that space makes all these problems that we think we have a lot less uh, painful. And it allows us to say, wow, it's like when, when we do something that's successful, the best time to do the next thing is right after that thing. Like the first thing, when you sell something or you win a championship, what do you do? Go compete again. Like, as you mentally, there's a certainty and it's amazing what kind of energy that attracts. And so I, I would just encourage you to start your day in gratitude uh, and find a way to, to get there, even if it's for five seconds. Man, that is all good stuff. We're, we're going to have to get you back on the show one of these days to, for follow up. I have to work on myself. So, um, you know, thank you for joining me today in the locker room, Damien. Where can our audience find you to carry on this conversation? Um, you know, are you a social media guy? Um, your website, where, where can people connect with you? Best place to find me is FU, financialunderdogs.com. It's my podcast. It's, it's where I live. It's where I rant. It's where I discuss. It's where I learn and grow and, and share and build a tribe of other underdogs. So if you want to connect with me, go to financialunderdogs.com and you'll find me hanging out. Perfect. I love that. Well, there you have it, folks. I truly hope that you picked up some actionable advice from Damian Lupo, something that you can apply today. I know I've, I've picked up multiple things um, that are relevant, uh, not only in your personal life, but in, in the uh, highly um, tumultuous world of real estate investing. Make sure to check out the Real Estate Locker Room Show on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. We're on iHeartRadio, Spotify, wherever you're listening to us right now. Um, we're obviously there. But the mission here is to help you elevate your real estate game. And if you like what this show is all about, uh, I'd be grateful if you'd leave us a review. I say it all the time, you know, reviews 
are uh, generally how that the currency online these days. It lets other people, like-minded people just like yourself, know that the content we're putting out is uh, worth checking out. So the post-game report show notes and links uh, and additional content related to this show will make sure that it's really easy for you to connect with Damien. Those are going to be on my website, johncarneyonline.com forward slash podcast. Um, 97. And while you're there, feel free to drop your name into the sign up form. We rarely ever send anything out. But uh, if you see something, that means that we find it um, super valuable. So remember to stay focused on your goals, folks. Have fun and stay in your game. Uh, until next week um, or next time, I'm John Carney. And uh, work hard, play hard, and raise the bar in. Damien, once again, um, you know, thanks for the insight. Um, keep up the awesome work. And I'm, I'm super stoked to get into the books in this package that you sent me. Appreciate it, John. Thanks, everybody. All right. We are